let's start by praying. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us together. And we pray for your blessing in this class as we look again at your eighth commandment, as we look at the evil of stealing. We pray, Lord, that we would never steal from you or from any of your children or from our neighbor. Help us to understand all that that means. Help us to see all things that you give to us as a stewardship that is owed to you. And help our minds be awake and alert this morning as we think about this throughout your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so last week we looked at the positive, the doing, the what is required. And you saw there, and in order to do that, we had to look at what property is. And in, in all the way back in Genesis with dominion and stewardship, and that obviously, uh, you know, we're painting with a broad brush. We're, there's all sorts of objections even against applying that. You know, we're talking about general principles here. You know, we, we can't, in a study like this, get into things like, well, where do you draw the line between my property and somebody else's property? Or uh, what's there first versus when I start working on it? And, and all these different things. And we'll get into a little bit of that today, but, you know, it's, uh, these are the general principles. So what is forbidden in the Eighth Commandment? And the answer is the Eighth Commandment forbiddeth whatsoever doth or may unjustly hinder our own or our neighbor's wealth or outward estate. That's, I don't have this in my notes, but that's a clue. I, I know I brought this up before about uh, our own. In the second table of the law, you'll keep seeing that, our own life, uh, our own property now. You'll see it in the Ninth Commandment again, our, our own good name. And that's in, in the case of property and theft, that's going to be a clue later on in our third point when we get to the, uh, I'm going to read a portion from the larger catechism. There's something uh, in the Westminster Standards that uh, libertarian folks who are, who are Reformed especially struggle with. But what I want to remind us of is that don't forget, there's not just private property and public property, it's all God's property. Psalm 24.1 the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Obviously, that includes your property. So when we get to things that um, the theology of the Westminster Divines is going to say, well, that's theft too. And you're going to say, no, it's not. I mean, that might be bad stewardship. We'll talk about things like gambling and, and we'll, we'll see things, or even the lack of charity. And you're like, well, that's bad, but that's not because I owe this or that to this person. And true, but don't forget, as we get to our outline, don't forget, I'm going to call this third thing vertical theft because don't forget that ultimately all of these things are God's property. So the Bible speaks of us actually being able to steal from God. Um, now, that's a relative term, uh, so we'll, we'll get to it. So this is the way I've broken it up today. The, uh, I've just very short and sweet, overt theft, covert theft, and vertical theft. In other words, ways that you can steal in obvious ways, out there in the open in a sense, uh, and then th uh, things that get a little trickier. And maybe they're not tricky for you, but they're the kind of things that people would say, well, no, that's not stealing, or I've got a good reason in my case. Or, or something like that, and then it becomes covert because then they start redefining terms. And then we'll get to uh, what I mentioned as vertical theft. So I, I brought part of the picture from the Sixth Commandment back into this, except instead of life, it's property. But here they are with guns. You're like, well, no, it looks like his life is in danger. Good, good, good observation. Because we're going to see a connection there. And that's why I've been talking about this whole life, liberty, and property thing. So let's Go back, a little bit of review, to unite these commandments. To steal from man is to steal from God. Just set that out from Psalm 24.1, and you can see that from other places. It's all God's. But all of this follows from everything we've seen so far. If we, if we just examine the logic of what we have looked at so far, that this is moral law, the Eighth Commandment, so it was there from the first. Something about man from the first involves, implies, creates property. And the image of God is the basic object that is violated when you're looking at the second table of the law. It's the most immediate object violated. So something about the nature of man 
is wrapped up in property. But it also follows from a third premise we've looked at, and that is stewardship. Because stealing does not just grasp from an individual image of God, what God has given to that person, but in that grasping, you've actually invaded the master-steward relationship. There's, a, there's another sense in which you're stealing from God when you steal another pers- from another person, or steal another person. We'll get to that. Um, because you are invading, you are intruding upon, you're presuming to be Lord over that person where God has actually, God's the one that expects a return from that person, not you. So um, God is the master in that parable of the talents that we looked at, for example, the master that went on a journey in verse 14. Uh, So in every scrap of private property, God is conducting business operations. Think of it like that. And, And the looters presume to break into heaven's stores because heaven has franchised on earth in private property. It's not like when we distinguish private property from God's property that uh, private property is a separate circle. Private property is a circle inside of God's property. So God's glory is the ultimate profit that is at stake and therefore should be our ultimate profit motive. So just as we saw with murder, so getting now to this picture, of life, liberty, and property. Now I'm going to reverse the arrows because now we're not just talking about an extension of man. Now we're talking about a violence against that. And here, unlike the sixth, life is not directly, you wouldn't think, life is not what is being attacked. Property is being attacked. But there is a connection. Okay, so just as we saw with murder, the unjust taking of life, same logic is going to apply with theft, the unjust taking of property. If it's wrong for the individual to do, then it's also wrong for the individual to incentivize someone else to do, whether by payment or by vote or by persuasion or just cheering him on. You know, there's a lot of Proverbs. I mentioned a couple last week about, um, you know, my son. Do not join with, you know, these these violent people. And And that's not just about murder. That's about theft. And so if it's wrong to do for the individual... Well, for them, that same reason, it is wrong for a group to get together and do it. And so it's wrong for the individual to transfer that supposed right, it's not a right, it's a wrong, to another group to incentivize to steal. So what logically follows from this, hopefully you can see what we talked about this in the Sixth Commandment, is that any form of collectivism that does that, and specifically something like socialism, or really any statist policy of violent redistribution. Whatever name you want to give to it, that would be the most violent form of transgressing the Eighth Commandment because you would be violating the most amount of property and uh, giving it the, uh, the nice, shiniest name to continue to do it. Uh, which is why all the warnings about Saul in 1 Samuel 8, uh, collecting gold and also co- uh, concluded Uh, collecting Israel's daughters. It's why in order to seize Naboth's vineyard, we've looked at that passage in Kings, Ahab ultimately had to spill Naboth's blood. There's a connection. And and there's, it's not just an incidental connection. You can't not do it. You can't um, start violating people's property without that being connected to their life. Eventually, there's going to be no more scrap of stuff for them to stand on in which you're not also violating their life. Um, This obviously includes stealing people, their very person. So 1 Timothy 1.10 calls this, uh, one of the the sins that that it lists is enslavers. And that goes back to the law of Moses, Exodus 21.16, whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. Now, you might be in your mind right now thinking about what so many critics of the Bible are always pointing out, uh, the distinction between enslaving captives from the Canaanites versus the Israelites. Now, those are the critics that at least know a little bit about their Bible. Those that don't will just say, well, how can those things be true? There was slavery in the Old Testament. That's sort of the, the basic objection that will be made. Some people know their Bible enough to know that, well, I I see there's passages in the Old Testament that call for um, not only good treatment of slaves and and then their freedom and jubilee and all that stuff, but um, but, uh, Deuteronomy 24-7, for example, if a man is found stealing one of his brothers of the people of Israel, 
And if he treats him as a slave or sells him, then that thief shall die. So you say, uh, okay, I get it. So uh, God wanted them to, to have a higher morality for themselves, but it was okay for them to take the Canaanites and whatever else. Now, there is an answer to that, but it's complex, and that gets into an apologetics class at that point. Um, so that would be a separate study for a separate day. But for our purposes, it's sufficient at least to show that to steal a man is to own his life, and theoretically, without any other restraint, subject the slave to murder at the whim of the owner. You say, well, yeah, but there were laws in Israel to prevent that. That's true. But apart from God's morality, there's nothing to stop that. There, there's no argument to prevent you once you have all of his property and everything that he stands on and moves within. Well, then he's pretty much literally your property to do with whatever you want. There's no real reason why you cannot murder him. So to follow the logic... Um, do I have a separate slide for this? I, I seem to remember. Yeah, I do. Sorry that that's small, um, but I'll read it. <laughs> Premise one, you cannot own a person, absolutely, without having full power to end his life. And you say, well, that's, that's true, but that's also silly, because I know where you're going with this, but I can own 10% of you, and, and that doesn't necessarily lead to your death. Okay, but I think even in admitting that, you're kind of getting on that slippery slope. And I think the principle, you see that the more of somebody's life you own, the more of their life you own, and you can do with it whatever you want. So in principle, premise two, you cannot own all extensions of a person, their property, their extension of their person, without also owning the person. Therefore, you cannot own all extensions of a person without having full power to end his life. Um, when that is something that people don't want to think about, they, as a people group, descend into slavery and eventually genocide. It's something that you have to think about in order to be vigilant to, to prevent that sort of thing from happening. So that's just about stealing persons. That's the progression of it. But the Law of Moses recognizes the connection between the Eighth Commandment and the sixth, even on the level of the individual. Right after, this is in Exodus chapter 22, um, right after the four or five-fold repayment that's mentioned there in verse 1, verses 2 and 3 go on to say that if a thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. But if the sun has risen on him, there shall be blood guilt for him. He shall surely pay. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. Now, I mentioned that in passing when we were at the Sixth Commandment. And the principle there was kind of like the, you know, the stand your ground laws. Why sunlight versus darkness? That sounds really ancient and superstitious. But no, the whole idea there was that you actually had a... Um, a um, sorry... Um, you actually had a clear and present danger of someone fearing for their life. So you actually were acting, that's the way they would assess, or at least that's the way they would express someone acting in actual self-defense versus some murder, because then it would be murder. It didn't need to happen, right? Well, now that same passage tells us something about property. And what it tells us about property is not, contrary to the way I opened off last time, those people that we're saying, you know, mostly peaceful protests, those people that started to redefine property and redefine rights. And they started to say, well, you can replace the property. Well, that's not the same as taking a person's life. Now, who are they arguing against? Nobody disagrees with that, but they're, they're setting you up there. But what this verse is saying is what Western man has, already, has always known, if he's honest, and that is that you can't lunge for somebody's property except by violence against their person. So this person, who's not in the sunlight, but is in the dark, he's defending his home. It, it, you know, have you tried that sometime? Do you have time to reason with the person and say, are you here just to steal my stereo or are you going after one of my kids? Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know. Glad we covered all that. No, that's, that's not the real world. And so the law of Moses is very, very... Uh, realistic here, uh, more realistic than we are, when we don't consider the connection between somebody's property and their life. So just notice that logic between killing versus murder, that distinction 
in that passage. That tells you something about property and the value that God sets on property. Well, um, I, do, I, don't, I don't have this on there, but I do have the Hodge quote. Um, first, um, Brockle gives another list. His section is really good for giving lists of what is uh, included and what is excluded and uh, in breaking the law, in, in keeping the law. And in this case, you have seven kinds of theft that are considered as terms in the object of theft. And he gives a couple of verses for each, which I, I don't list here, but I'll just list these seven. He, he lists ecclesiastical theft, so there would be a more direct stealing from God. There's secondly the theft of men, so there he means slavery or enslaving. Thirdly, the defrauding of the nation. Fourth, the theft of cattle. Fifth, the theft of property, that's more overt there. And six, armed robbery. And seven, to be the accomplice of thieves. So in other words, even to help them, um, which we have in our legal system, we understand that. The accomplice of thieves is, is to enable theft. So to some extent, a lesser extent, it is to actually commit theft. So naturally, any and all of these can be done not just by the individual, but by collective force. And again, to a much more violent degree, by the state. Um, that's, that's a very important point to make. Charles Hodge uh, counteracts all this idea that we looked at last week about the person that devalues property and devalues um, and devalues theft, what was I getting at, that, that individual right of property, um, he's going to make the point again, now not about life, but now about property, that this does not arise in civil law. It's something God gives, civil law recognizes it, or it's not a just civil law. So Hodge says it like this, the law of the land has indeed legitimately much to do with questions of property, but the right itself does not rest upon that law and is in the sight of God independent of it. The right exists prior to all law of the state. The law cannot ignore that right. Now, the civil law cannot... Here's another way to say that. The civil law can't ignore that higher natural law or that higher divine law. It cannot rightfully deprive a man of his property. What's the it in that sentence? The civil law, the civil magistrate, cannot rightfully, that's illegal for the civil law. No, it's not. The civil magistrate makes the law. That's not for, That's a departure from 2,500 years of Christian and pagan thought. That's a descent into animal thought. Don't, don't think like that. The law cannot ignore that right. It cannot rightfully deprive a man of his property except in punishment of crime or on the grounds of stringent necessity, and in the latter case, with due compensation. I didn't cover this when I did the Sixth Commandment, but you could ask this about life or property. Hodge just said, except in punishment of crime. Why is it, this is one of the objections against not just Christianity, but it's any traditional morality. Um, why is it okay, capital punishment or, um, or, or, dep- or jailing someone, if, if the sanctity of life is so important for life in the womb and from the womb to the tomb and the sanctity of property and all that stuff, then why is it right to have capital punishment or to jail people or to, or to seize their assets or whatever if they commit some crime? According to you, it's this inviolable, it's unalienable. And if it's inalienable, it's a right. Well, then how can you make exceptions? Um, the short answer, and different political theorists like John Locke and others have talked about this, and there's a very Christian way to put it in covenantal language, that such a person has stepped outside of the bonds of humanity. They've, in other words, they've, they've gone back on the covenant, they've stepped outside of the covenant, and just like an invading army, they're now not subject to, they're not privy to, we're going to look at next, next week of the knife, they're not privy to that information. They're not uh, subject, uh, they're not uh, privileged, what's the word I'm really looking for? They're not heirs anymore of that covenant. Uh, they are, at that point, uh, playing the role of a violent aggressor. And so they are, they are removed from the privileges of that covenant. Okay? Now, maybe, maybe people won't buy that, but that's, that's the basic argument for it. Okay, when we get to covert theft, I think the Heidelberg Catechism helps us. Uh, question 110 asks, What does God forbid in the Eighth Commandment? 
And, and why do I do these lists? Well, because it starts to get us into things that are not as easy to see on the surface. Okay, so it answers, not only such theft and robbery as are punished by the magistrate, but God views as theft all wicked tricks and devices whereby we seek to draw ourselves, I think there should be a comma, our neighbor's goods, oh no, draw to, sorry, my bad, it was right, I, was, I missed a word, seek to draw to ourselves our neighbor's goods, whether by force or with show of right, such as unjust weights, L's, measures, wares, coins, usury, don't worry, we won't get into all of that, or any means forbidden of God, so moreover all covetousness and all useless waste of his gifts. Remember that one. We'll get to it. Um, but this answer distinguishes between what we're calling overt theft and covert theft. Not only such theft and robbery as are punished by the magistrate, but God views as theft all wicked tricks and devices. So in other words, even if you can get away with it by the letter of the civil law, as it presently is, God sees it for what it is. Or even if you are an agent of the civil law and therefore can get away with it, God still views it as theft. I have a list here. Now, not of, um, not of exceptions, or as um, when I say public claims here, the first thing I want to mean by that are some objections. And you may recognize some of these, or you may recognize all of these. And they're good reasons, <laughs> they're excuses for why we can start to pillage property. And all of them, in one flavor or another, are basically Marxist. Some of them are more popular level, like inequality is unjust. That's sort of just the pop level social justice. You don't even have to be a Marxist to spout that. You hear it. It's learned behavior, and you just parrot that because that's what you heard. Or you have this sense of things that are attached to inequality that, that are unjust. Treatment of the poor... Um, and various things like that. And then you have more sophisticated aspects of Marxist theory. And then you even have, in these last three, elements that even, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but um, common good conservatism, um, where, and it's especially catching on in the last five or six years, where some of what they say is, is in agreement, at least at those points, with Marx's original critique. And you'll even see some of this in C.S. Lewis or Tolkien or, or others. Um, a more modern theorist would be Roger Scruton, who laments the way that the free market debases uh, the environment, for example. Whatever you may think about that issue, that's one of the arguments they make. Or that it displaces family, industrialization, uh, leads to the situation where everybody moves from the farms to the cities, they have less kids, etc., and it actually leads to the destruction even of that culture. You know, so, or it debases things, you know, you turn on TV. Uh, it, it makes us into the kind of people that care only about consumeristic products or whatever, and not the excellence of them or whatever else. Now, whatever you think about any of those, what, a good rule of thumb, I always tell people, and I'm actually going to mention a version of this in the, in the sermon today about tradition, when in doubt, come back to the ABCs of God's commandments. There's only 10 of them when we're talking about the moral law. Of course, all the other ones are extensions of that. But when you get lost in the deep end of the pool, ask yourself, wait a minute, will this commitment or this theory or this criticism, it sounds very good at the moment, will it have me violating one of God's clear commandments? Like, it, it, suppose I start to care about this. Does this make me want to start pillaging and lighting fires and taking things from people that have done no wrong, at least to me, or with that property? Well, then that's a, probably a pretty good indication that you are captive of the devil at this point, or that you've bought into some lie of culture, or that, as I always say, every lie is a twisted truth. There's elements of truth in these things. That's what makes them such good lies, you know? The devil doesn't come up with bad lies. He comes up with good lies. 
He's a liar from the beginning. And so what I just tell people is, good rule of thumb, if you find yourself drowning in the deep end of the pool, are you being asked, do you have the sudden urge to violate a clear commandment such as the Eighth Commandment? If so, come back to the shallow end of the pool and, and just and think about this. You're, you're out of step with God's law. Now, what about some of the secret um, kinds of theft or, or harder to see? Um, one of them is fraud or, or, in biblical language, unequal scales. So, Proverbs 11.1, 1, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. And there's different ways to have a false balance. You might think of a business owner doing that or somebody that has a balance and they're skilled and so they have, there's a one up on you. You don't know what the actual uh, weight of this, especially that was a hard thing before paper money. You'd have different metals, one of which may seem like it was heavier than another and so forth. And you could really defraud people in, in different ways like that. Of course, now we do it with fine print or the IRS can help you out with, uh, with uh, fraud if you want the government to defraud you. Um, we'll mention one in the application as well. Um, for example, printing currency faster than there are goods to back them up is a way to both defraud and steal uh, from your population. Uh, so we'll get to that. But God delights in right or fair scales. And, and when the Bible gets to these things, I suppose we, we kind of gloss over them in the Proverbs, but if anybody brings it up, we're like, well, God delights in something as materialistic as equal measurements in money and exchange. Are we really talking about this in a Sunday school? Um, well, I would offer a correction. If God delights in it, then you can bet that it was His own glory that He's delighting in and not the paper or the metal or anything like that in its own right. So it's not materialistic because all material is about Him, or else you're really the one with an idol of neutrality. God gave us money in order to prove to the world and to ourselves that money is not our God. Um, he, he entrusts things to us partly to not be idol worshipers, to use them in such a way that, that glorifies Him. Okay. Um, let's take a few of these that Brockle mentions. Since he has such good lists, I'll mention just three of his list of, I don't remember what he calls them, but, but they're ba looking at the Heidelberg, the more secret or co covert ways to steal. Here's three that he mentions that you might not think of. Um, first, there is the withholding or reduction. I have this. Yes, I do. There is the withholding or reduction of wages. Uh, so he uses James 5.4. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. So the laborers are crying out. And you, you say, okay, so is this a passage telling me that I ought to pay them more or what somebody else thinks? No, not necessarily. All it has to mean is that you have agreed to something with your laborers and you are not giving uh, the laborers that thing. I hear about that all the time. Uh, you know, employers hiring somebody, usually it's low level pay type jobs, and then uh, the job gets outsourced or the company doesn't work out or whatever else, and, and there's a situation where they actually can pay them and say, nope, or something like that. That that's, that's, thing still happens. Um, Brockle mentions there is purchasing on credit while knowing all along that one either will not or cannot pay. So Psalm 37, 21, the wicked borroweth and payeth not again. There is the establishing of a monopoly. That is the conspiring of some to have the market to themselves, especially if they do this relative to grain and other edible commodities, not selling them below such an excessive price. Proverbs eleven twenty six, he that withholdeth corn the people shall curse him. So establishing of a monopoly. And contrary to popular leftist thinking, no, a monopoly is not just when somebody's really, really good at something and makes a profit and better than everybody else at that. But here it specifically addresses somebody who conspires to have the market. You're not conspiring to have the market in this bad way just by being good at producing something. But you are doing that if you use force or fraud to do that. 
And more often than not, the government helps them do that. Um, and I would think that this should include also, it says, Brockle says, especially if they do this relative to grain and other edibles, well, Proverbs, that verse mentions that kind of a commodity, corn. So you would think that one of the ways you shouldn't do this is to, you know, torch food factories and things like that. Or to close down those markets or those producers altogether in the Netherlands, just hypothetically. When out of the other side of your mouth you say, I'm so concerned for the poor, there's not enough food in the world. Let's burn down these things and let's close down these farms and so on and so forth. Uh, that's, that's wicked, that's theft, that's destruction of property, that's destruction of livelihood. And it's setting up the poor to become poor so that you can swoop in and be a monopoly to take care of the poor and do it all over again to more people. Uh, that's wicked. So not only is there an overt and covert distinction, but also between uh, force and a fraud that is, that is a feigned justice. So one of the things that Heidelberg mentioned, yeah, there it is. It mentions, whereby we seek to draw to ourselves our neighbor's good, whether by force or with a show of right. So we have to do this because otherwise everybody will starve and die if we don't steal it from these people and give it to them and so forth. So that's what would be meant by a show of right, or simply calling it by different names, uh, such as social justice. That seems to be the one in the past generation that is the big one. So that's what's meant by a show of of right, an intentional fraud, a farce, a deception with nicer names. And of course, the more elaborate such a deception is, the greater the threat, the more greatly this commandment has been violated. So you do it on a greater scale, you're violating more people's property. All right, uh, one, one other uh, um, one that's mentioned sort of in an old-fashioned way by Brockle, but the way we do it today is sort of the... Um, the death tax, as it's been called. So um, you, um, you punish fathers, really, uh, in not allowing them to leave an inheritance uh, to their children. And uh, what's the basis of doing this? I mean, I'm talking morally. What, what sort of an excuse would people have for this? Well, they're not there anymore. The, the world belongs to the living, etc. But that's not what's going on here. It's, it's because it's something wealthy. It's because wealth would be passed on. All right, but this is to steal from the family line. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 28, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. There's a lot of applications to that passage, but one of them is property. All right, but supposing that the state has exceeded its proper bounds here as well, it's objected by many that the Bible doesn't give us any recourse to censure the state, to think differently about it, but that's false. Consider the reply of John the Baptist to two different civil officials that came to him in Luke 3, 12 through 14. Uh, John does not answer them back by saying, hey, that's not a gospel issue. I'm just a minister, man. Leave me alone. Uh, he says in Luke 3, 12 through 14, tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. So soldiers also asked him, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats, or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. So here we have traitor Jewish tax collectors and bloody Roman occupiers who seem to have a higher respect for the authority of God's church than, unfortunately, a lot of Americans do. And, and I would suggest that that's one of the things in maybe the civil use of the law that, that has to change. Uh, these two kinds of civil officers came to John the Baptist to find out what the limits are on the state with respect to private property, and the Bible is not silent about it. Well, then you get, finally, vertical theft. Oh, private. That just represents something that we have already looked at. Yes, private claims, public claims, whatever you think about them, wherever you think those circles should be, just remember, they're all ultimately divine claims because it's ultimately God's property. Okay, so vertical theft now... Now we're getting, okay, this is God's. Well, we, it, it already was God's. But now we are more immediately doing something that, that we have to get into that category of stealing from, from God for, for one reason or another, either because the Bible says it with respect to tithes or because it's going to help us explain why one of the other ones is uh, under the focus that it is. So there's certain items that the Reformed tradition, I mentioned this in the intro, 
certain items that the Reformed tradition has called unjust in this area that Christians who are more libertarian will struggle with and do struggle with. I've heard it. Um, they'll say, um, I, I, I reject your catechism and your confession now because it has these things about the Eighth Commandment, <laughs> about, um, about giving in this case. There's other things too, but in the larger catechism, here's what I'm talking about. Under the duties required in the Eighth Commandment, and this is question 141, it's included these two things, giving and lending freely according to our abilities. So this is what's required under the Eighth Commandment. Giving and lending freely according to our abilities and the necessities of others. Moderating our judgments, wills, and affections concerning worldly goods. So we've got two things there. Giving, charity, and then we'll cover these two. We'll cover all three, really, but, but it'll focus on these in a way that, um, the, by the way, the reason investing and gambling are right next to each other, you'll see in a second, one of the pushbacks against gambling being a violation is to say, well, it's the same thing. Investing is the same thing as gambling. So these are not, um, they're not in the circle because they're, they're wrong. They're all in the same basic category. How do I use my money as a steward to God? And the moment I have that category, then the phrase stealing from God makes perfect sense. Because it's his property, and he's expecting return. But he's expecting return in different forms. So you, you, this is going to poor people, or poorer people, or just somebody in it that needs help at a moment. This is going to the church. This is going to the stock market. This is going to Las Vegas or, or even just some private you know, game I'm, I'm, I'm playing or whatever, game of cards or something like that. And so libertarian types look at this um, more on some than others. Other people might look at other things weirdly. And, um, and they say, well, maybe that's, maybe that's required by the moral law, maybe under, maybe under um, the golden rule. Maybe we can, so it's part of the golden rule. And so, therefore, it's part of the moral law in that sense. But why include it under the Eighth Commandment? I mean, that just confuses justice with charity in the same way that leftists utilize that concept of social justice. You're saying that, it, so if I don't give X amount to, to this person, whoever they are, then I'm stealing? Stealing from them? That's where they wanted to go in their objection. But see, I've cut that out with this category of vertical theft. Suppose that the reason we ought to give and be charitable is not because we're remedying some wrong as if that money is by right that person's. That really would be saying, and that is what leftist economics, especially Marxism, believes. If property is theft, then in some way that's the people's money or the laborer's money in the case of profit or whatever it is. And so you're, you're just joining in with that now. You're just saying that that is theirs by right. This is a remedy. Therefore, I'm stealing from somebody. Yes, but what if you're stealing from God? Because as part of your stewardship from God, you are to love your neighbor as yourself, right? So then that, so now, can I answer for the Westminster Divines and say that is for sure what they were thinking? No, I have to confess I can't. Uh, I, I can't speak for them. But I think they were pretty good thinkers, so I don't think they were buying into a, a social justice notion that this is a remedy because it's by right that poor person's or whatever else. They're not saying that. I, I think they're saying something more like this. And if they weren't, I'm okay with that. I'm saying that <laughs> because that's how I can justify that language in the Westminster Larger Catechism and say that this is ultimately a stewardship to God. And therefore, when we don't do these things in, in, in some way, and, and it maybe look different for every Christian. Doesn't, this doesn't answer questions like, so i got to give to that guy that's panhandling on the... This doesn't answer that. That's specifics. I would, I mean, that's, that's a wisdom issue. We can talk about that. But as a general rule, this is God's property. This is stewardship. I can steal from God. Okay, I got it now. All right? This is foundational to the tithe. So Malachi 3.8, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. Again, it's, it's not saying, Malachi is not saying that that money is by right the ministers. Well, the minister doesn't have any inherent right, or, or these particular ministries, whatever ministries you want the tithe to go to. 
Again, the point is that it's ultimately God's property. The prophets spoke of God shaking up the nations by the coming of Christ. And so in Haggai 2, 6 through 9, you have this idea of God shaking up the nations, and all the wealth of the nations is going to come pouring into the church for use in His kingdom. So that's the mindset you have to have. And uh, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each one of us must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The, the idea there is, some people say, well, is tithe, I don't see tithe in the New Testament. That's true, you don't see the word tithe in the New Testament. But the rationale for the tithes that were in the Old Testament are all still there in the New Testament. And there Paul does talk about the voluntary aspect of it, that it's not virtuous at all if it's done begrudgingly. So the idea is not necessarily about amounts or whatever else, or one person has to give the same as somebody else, but the idea again is that it's God's and we should want to, we should have a joy in building His kingdom. Uh, likewise with gambling, and you see this in Westminster Larger Catechism, question, the next question, 142, which I won't read, but it uses the expression wasteful gaming. So this is not just a, an opinion of, say, G.I. Williamson in his study guide of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. That's where the church back in Boise that I was at first ran into this, because we were using that book as a study guide for our uh, high schoolers and junior high schoolers in this academy. And so they had, that, so they had a big argument. Uh, <laughs> my associate pastor had to deal with the argument, uh, Josh, against all the kids. Most of the kids, I think, took the other. What? Gambling? Probably because they were gambling. Um, in between classes, I don't know. I can't say for sure. But they took issue with this. What do you mean gambling is... Uh, is a violation of the Eighth Commandment. And, um, you know, they, so they made their argument. And anyway, this, this argument spilled over into the men's retreat. <laughs> and one guy said, uh, objected to him. He said, well, it's no different than investing. And um, in one sense, that's true. In another sense, I don't think it is. Wasteful gaming. We, we said, but, but the investment in the stock market's wasteful. Uh, from that perspective, getting up in the morning is wasteful. That's a risk. I mean, if we're going to define wasteful as any risk... Well, getting up in the morning is a risk, but I think, that's, that, I think that's being equivocal and playing with terms a little bit too much. This idea of wasteful spending, or as another translation of the Heidelberg puts it, pointless squandering. Uh, it uses the expression, a useless waste of his gifts. And again, I think that's, that's the crucial point. So, so if it, here's an analogy. As skydiving is to the sixth commandment, so is gambling to the eighth. You say, nonsense. What about parachute, you know, the, the skydivers from the, you know, World War II, they're, they're, they're skydiving into, uh, come on. That's not this. Yes, it is. They're both descending from the sky. Okay, but you're descending from the sky for thrills. You're de- okay, anyway, there's my argument. There's my argument for it. Um, it's, not, it's just that it's not the same. However you work that out, I would say that it would be a false analogy to say that this is exactly the same as this. Point is, that's the larger category, uh, wherever you fall on that. I don't have a section on the evangelical and directive use of the law uh, this time. The only thing I would add to civil use of the law is um, I'm I'm leaving aside the question of, you know, usury and and, and how about this one, if you know libertarians. We all all have libertarian friends. Maybe you're a libertarian. I have a libertarian part of me that's libertarian, not the whole of me. So I have like a libertarian on my shoulder. Um, Every once in a while I hear them in a class like this. But what about this one? Taxation is theft. Surely we've all heard that. Um, Maybe we've got it on a coffee mug or something. I don't. But um, what do I say about that? I'm not going to answer that too directly um, because I do have a few answers for it, but then it just just grows into other objections against that. Um, It is an interesting question. I I wouldn't say the Bible's entirely silent on it. Um, There are texts that talk about Paying our taxes, we know that, Romans 13. There's another uh, text in Matthew, which we'll get to in Matthew's Gospel, Lord willing, where Peter talks about paying the tax. And I'm not talking about the denarii, where they tried to trick him up, trip him up in chapter 22. I'm talking about another one where he sees uh, the, the, the coin and the fish. So there's a little bit of his omniscience going on there too. And he has them pay the tax. But he says before that, that the sons of the kingdom are exempt. And you say, well, he's just making a mini parable there. It does look like it, but there's some people that would say that he's doing more than that. But he's saying, but in order to not give offense, here's, here's the tax, pay the tax. What is going on there? And I'm not going to answer that because uh, it's a controversial passage. 
And we'll get to it when we do Matthew's gospel. So unfortunately, I won't be able to answer that. But I will say something about unjust weights, because I think the modern form of that is inflating currencies in monetary policy. Um, the people who do that are not dumb. They know, how, they know what inflation is. Contrary to what you've just heard on the news for the past six months, no inflation is not a made-up word that conservatives just came up with uh, to make some people look bad. No, it's an actual thing that you learn in Basic Economics 101. It's any time more dollars start to flow to the same amount of goods, that drives the goods up. They're, they they're start bidding or offering off to the highest bidder. Okay, that, that's just a simple thing. So what happens when that doesn't happen in the normal ebb and flow of the market? What happens when the bank, knowing full well what the GDP is, but just prints more money just for kicks or because they want, for whatever reason? Well, they know how it works. They're driving up the price of things and doing it on purpose. When a, uh, a government's monetary policy does that, that, that's a form of theft or defrauding a nation. Okay? Now, it's entirely possible that they're that dumb, but I don't, I don't think so um, when you see that kind of inflation of a currency. So, um, and it's something that kills poor people especially because, of course, as things go up uniformly, who uh, is less able to pay that? The poor people are, okay? So um, that's not just something that, you know, wealthier people care about. That's something that poor people should care about more, and we should care about as Christians. So anyway, it's not an economics class, but I will say that. That is an example of the biblical uh, commandment against unequal scales when governments do that. Um, I will leave it at that. There's all sorts of ways to, to apply this, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for today and open it up to questions on last week or this week anything about property I said last week two weeks ago right the Broncos issue on corn yeah. actually expands to the ox cart and the ox if somebody controls all those you can't get to market yeah, yeah. And that's what happens also in our current industry. Yeah, right. And I think it's easier and easier for the government to get away with this for various reasons. One of them is that less and less people understand agriculture, and I don't pretend to understand agriculture. I grew up in New York. I don't know about agriculture. But I know enough to know that I've run into a lot of people that do know a lot about agriculture. In fact, people that even have chickens in their backyard and stuff like that. Um, so um, when the government does buy up more and more of this land, more and more of those commodities, it's not just they're doing that. They're then telling other people, you can't do that. And when they say, you can't do that, well, then you can't just explain that away as, well, you know, they have to do that for X, Y, and Z reason, for food safety, blah, blah, blah. Now you're getting into the, um, you know, for example, the, one of the first acts by the governor of Michigan uh, during the COVID lockdowns was an all-out restriction and making it illegal for stores to sell, including ones that were already selling it, like Home Depot or whatever, anything seed-related, anything to do with food. And you're like, why? What's that got to do with keeping people safe? Ah, yeah, nothing, just about like everything else. And so uh, the food supply, uh, immediately, their, their eyes set on the food supply. And if you're not paying attention to what's going on in the Netherlands, that's absolutely what they've bought up, like, all the farmland and uh, nationalized all of it. And they've, you know, they have to be careful how they do that. They can't do that like Stalin did in the 30s. They can't just wipe people out and kill them by the millions. There's cameras watching now. Um, but they've got an advantage. More and more people have no idea what any of this means and would rather not talk about it. And so they can just, in full view of the world, buy up all the land, drive those people off, and essentially starve whoever they want drive up the price to whoever they want and control who gets to buy and who gets to sell. Um, and nobody wants to, nobody can think about that anymore. And so they, can get, they, they don't really have to just kill you right away <laughs> to do it. They can just walk in there and do it. So yeah, that's, uh, that is, certainly falls under uh, what he meant by defrauding a nation. Any other comments or? Mm-hmm. The issue of charity, that, that is where we develop the school systems and the hospitals yeah. out of those types of investing. Yeah. Yeah, and the church did do that for centuries better 
that everybody else in the church uh, partly partly dropped the ball, but partly were you know it's not just it's not just that it was the church's failure. I mean, there were other forces coming coming in to take those over and convince people to to farm that out to more general things. But it's just but the but it's also better when the church does it or when any local or obviously your family. It's better when your family does something for you than if you farm that out to somebody else. So that's just that principle. It's sometimes called the principle of subsidiarity. The church can do that better and, and care for the whole person's soul uh, when, the, when those things, like uh, even a food pantry type stuff, uh, when those things are tied to you know, church attendance, some of the same things you would expect of a member, um, you're then discipling that person who you're feeding. You're also feeding their soul. And uh, the church is uniquely equipped to do that in a way that no other institution is. All right, well, I'll cut it there and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time and this study. We pray that You would fill our minds and our hearts up with ways not only to not uh, commit the sin of this commandment, but also positive ways to further in ourselves and our neighbors, that which you have entrusted to us, those material resources that we oftentimes think of as neutral, as though we might not say it is not your property, we, we often live like it. So we pray that you would deal with our hearts in that, and you would stir up in us a positive vision for how the church can do these things better. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.